So today, I originally started preparing this um, before all of this stuff started. Um, so we're going to be talking about uh, the US sanction schemes. Um, it, this came about because of the interest in the Magnitsky Act. And um, of course, now when I speak, um, I'm going to tell you the structures under which the new sanctions are being imposed. Um, everything I'm talking about from Magnitsky to um, OFAC is almost old news um, because right now there are so many new san sanction schemes uh, that are coming out through the president um, uh, in the United States and of course in um, the UK and um, in Europe. Um, the US I have to say is being the most active. Um, uh, I tried very hard to get um, the Magnitsky Act and, and maybe Victor, I can pass this to you. I tried to get a Russian copy um, because I think it would be a good idea. It's not long. Um, and there was an executive order actually passed under President Trump, which um, enhances the powers of the Magnitsky Act. So we will um, discuss this now. Um, we're gonna start first. Actually, first I'm going to just mention something connected to last week. Um, and maybe related to what's going on here. Um, one case that has just had a decision on appeal um, to go forward for universal jurisdiction. And I saw just now the um, Minister of Justice in Ukraine, uh, there's so much debate going on why this can't come to the International Criminal Court because neither party is a signatory. Um, and there's a lot of frustration um, also about the war of aggression. Can this be prosecuted? All, all of these, these things are coming up now between lawyers. But one thing to remember is what we learned, we discussed in our last session uh, about a month ago was universal jurisdiction. We looked at the cases in Syria and I'm sorry, the Syrian cases in Germany and how they were being prosecuted as these universal crimes. When we discuss Germany, when we discuss the other ways of, of uh, prior to that, doing it in the US or European Court of Human Rights, there always had to be uh, a connector. There had to be a victim or perpetrator in Germany um, that triggered the, the interest and the prosecution. Same with the cases in Finland, same with the cases in Switzerland. Um, just now, um, it started last year, um, the appeal decision came out at the end of December. In Argentina, um, Argentina and Spain are two very active universal jurisdiction places. Uh, Argentina allowed the Rohingya <laughs> to file, um, uh, using an Argentinian lawyer to file universal jurisdiction. Perpetrators, victims, everybody is in Myanmar. No person is in Argentina. Um, originally, when it went to the first level of the court, the court said this is a case for the International Criminal Court or for the ICJ. On appeal, they've decided to take this case. So it's going to be very interesting to watch. So that's something to keep in mind, that there are now, that there's this, this momentum and a, a lot in, in Spain and in Latin America um, to push forward with universal jurisdiction cases and you do not need to have a victim or a perpetrator in the country. You can just contact a lawyer, you can raise the issues and they can proceed through a domestic court. Um, and just a reminder, US doesn't do it. US doesn't do universal jurisdiction, but basically um, this is a really big development and, and this is something to keep in mind that anybody can bring um, this kind of case now. Um, I am going to share a screen and bring up a PowerPoint on, it was very difficult for me to organize this um, because the Magnitsky Act is, is very relevant, um, but I'm going to start first with a broader discussion about an office in the United States government. All of the um, sanctions that we're gonna discuss, all the sanctions in the United States government fall under the Department of Treasury. The Department of Treasury and the Department of Justice, many people don't know this, is part of the executive branch in the United States government. So it falls directly under the president. When I um, am able to uh, either, I mean, I hope I hope I don't, Victor doesn't have to translate. When, when Victor's able to get the Magnitsky Act, you'll see that they keep mentioning the office of the president. In fact, that's the Department of Treasury. Um, so while Biden is announcing sanctions, 
all of this is being approved and created in the Department of Treasury. And here is for you a picture of the Department of Treasury. Um, so the um, uh, rules that are concerning um, sanctions come from the Office of Foreign Assets Control, which is in the Department of Treasury. Treasury. It's called OFAC is the shortening. Um, uh, and uh, it is the group that works on the sanctions, that creates the sanctions, that keeps the list of people who are being punished, that keeps the list of people who cannot have access to the US, who cannot have bank accounts, who are not allowed to trade in US currency. That is all um, uh, kept in this uh, department. Um, now, who is in there? These are um, government officials, but it has a big team of human rights experts. So you have people who are experts in Russia, experts who are Russia in, in Iran, in um, Middle East, uh, in Saudi Arabia, in that area, in this office, working and gathering the information. One of the things that we're gonna talk about today is how you as a human rights activist and as an NGO um, can get um, information to them. Um, when you read uh, the OFAC documents, sanctions documents, um, Magnitsky Act, while it says information can come from, uh, you know, it comes to the president from congressional committees. And this, the other group that it says the information comes from is NGOs, non-governmental organizations. So that information is carried at the same weight as the reports that are going to be coming from Treasury or that a congressional committee um, will, will have. So that's a very important thing to keep in mind. Um, and it becomes a question of establishing that contact with OFAC. Um, and also, perhaps the easier one, um, I have, uh, I've spoken to them, but one of the, the ways that might be easier for you is to establish a contact with a US NGO that works in this area. One that comes to mind is Human Rights First, which is based in Washington, DC. And I'm going to try to establish a contact um, so that that can be um, a channel back and forth right now. And I will tell you, because I was trying to talk to somebody in Treasury um, yesterday, you can't talk to anybody. They are deep, deep, deep in dealing um, with Russia. So um, it's going to be a little bit of a, until this is calmer, um, it's not gonna be really possible. And at the moment, I think everybody everybody who could be sanctioned um, is probably being sanctioned. Um, okay, let me go to the next slide. Oops. So the Office of Foreign Assets Control uh, of the US Department of Treasury administers and enforces economic trade sanctions based on US foreign policy and national security goals against targeted foreign countries and regimes, terrorists, international narcotics traffickers, those engaged in activities related to the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction and other threats to national security, foreign policy or economy of the United States. So this department um, is creating and reacting immediately to political change. As we saw yesterday when um, President Biden went on television and just started listing all of the sanctions that have come out. It's a very active, um, while it has, uh, we'll discuss OFAC rules, um, which are consistent and deal with money coming in and out of the United States and cooperate with every bank in the United States. So for example, if you put on a bank transfer from Germany to the United States, some word that triggers, like you put ISIS or you put, um, you know, Kiev, or you put some word that might trigger something. Um, and it doesn't have to do with my banker picking up on this word. It's an automatic thing that happens when a wire comes into the United States. Um, so this is a standard that is set up and is not affected by the political um, changes in this. But then OFAC is also covering this, the um, targeted foreign countries and regimes, terrorists, um, which is a um, constantly changing monitoring uh, group of sanctions that are being developed and built. So 
So what happens when OFAC um, picks up on uh, transfers that are coming in, when OFAC is examining a country, and I'll, I'll, I won't use Russia for this example, I'll use Albania and Kosovo. Um, there are numerous people there who are involved in different criminal activities um, from money laundering, um, counterfeiting, counterfeiting um, that have uh, presence in the United States, that have bank accounts, that have properties, that have what happens. Um, the first thing is that when they're, when they're recognized, they're put on a list. And this is called the Specially Designated Nationals and Blocked Persons List. These individuals, um, uh, they are, one, uh, no longer allowed to have property or any assets in the United States. So if they have a bank account or they have um, a house somewhere in New Jersey or wherever, all of that is frozen and seized. Um, uh, this is exactly what is happening now um, with Russian uh, groups. Um, as you saw, they are now freezing bank um, uh, uh, banks um, that are coming in, so there won't be any any trade. And that means for the United States that that country cannot that that entity cannot trade in U.S. currency. So they're they're blocked in many many ways um, from from. Uh, par participating commercially um, and economically with the United States. So again, uh, these people are not allowed in the US. They're put on lists where they cannot fly in. They cannot um, uh, get in uh, on a plane that is flying to the United States. Um, so this is a, a serious um, level that they, they can be taken. And you know, you're gonna think, Oh, these are the in individuals that were named by Magnitsky. Um, these are the individuals that are, um, you know, the special ones. I think uh, under the Trump thing, they put out a list of 19 people and 39 were added by the Treasury. No, this is thousands of people. This is people who are being, um, you know, like I right now have information on a, a mayor from Albania. These are people all over the world who whatever reason are seen to be um, illegally using US dollars um, and for this reason are not allowed in the US. It's an enormous list. What are their options? Um, they can appeal. They have a right to have a lawyer um, in the United States come and argue on their behalf. Um, and, and there are times that these people are removed if they can provide documentation um, that shows that they have not actually participated in what they're being um, charged with. Um, but in most cases, the research of the Department of Treasury of OFAC is extensive um, and it is unusual um, that somebody's removed. But in Washington, there are entire law firms that deal with this, that will work with um, somebody who is a specially designated person because first of all, they, these people usually have a lot of money. <laughs> so if a party's on the list, parties are subject to US jurisdiction. They're prohibited from entering most types of business transaction um, uh, with uh, anywhere in the world. So if you're a US citizen, and somebody in Albania is on the SDN, you cannot travel to Albania to work with him. You cannot travel to France with him. You cannot travel to Russia. They are out for any sort of business um, partnerships with anybody in the United States. If you do this, if you as a US company, as a US individual do this, you will, you will fall under the same designation. You will become a specially designated person and your finances and assets will be frozen. Yeah, so every year um, OFAC typically adds up to a thousand or more parties to the sanction list and more and more are being added every day. Um, these are huge compliance uh, uh, risks for many US companies. And it has become customary now that when US companies engage in international business, especially from regions that are, are being monitored um, in the Balkans, um, Russia, Iran, um, any of these regions, that they go um, to the OFAC website where they are able to examine the full list of people who are on these lists. It is public.
So they can um, seize any bank account. They can seize um, any checks, money orders, wire transfers. ACH is a different way of uh, moving money that they can also um, seize. Um, loans of any kind, visa accounts, trust accounts, car sales, collateral held as security, safety deposit box. What this means that every bank in the United States has nothing is um, confidential. <laughs> so every bank has information on um, the checking account, the bank account, the wire transfer. Every time that, uh, oh, let's say for example, let's say a visa charge or a wire account, wire transfer is going to one of these countries or a word in this um, triggers or a name, an individual's name triggers an automatic, and it's not the individual in the bank, this is a computer thing where they pick up right away, everything becomes frozen. You, will, The transfer will not go through, um, the sale will not go through, the check will not go through, everything will automatically be um, blocked by the bank by order of OFAC. And this happens all the time. It happens mistakenly, it happens all the time um, in every bank. It is not some unusual, weird, um, infrequent sort of sanction thing. This is every, even I, I live in a suburb of Philadelphia, even here, this has happened to me. I had a check coming, uh, a transfer coming for a project I did in the UK. Um, uh, the person put, I think MLS or MPS for the code for the project that we were working on. And that triggered something in OFAC. So my check got <laughs> held for two weeks um, until it was cleared. Um, so it, the U.S. is very on this. Um, the U.S. is the most careful and the most on it of any country um, that I am aware of. Um, the U.K. is not. Um, and we're going to have a very brief discussion when we talk about the um, Global Magnitsky Act and the um, uh, UK's version of it. Um, they are only now this week actually um, creating something similar to this and only this week did they um, stop a program that they have um, called the Golden Visa program where anybody can come um, from uh, any country as long as they bring I think it's two and a half million pounds um, and get permanent residence and visa uh, without any any checks or anything. So you can imagine, I think the number, the first number that was released was 14,000 Russians um, have done this. And when you say 14,000, um, you don't mean, you mean at least double that because that will then bring in wives, children, um, family that can come in once somebody has permanent residence in the UK. The US is not at all like that. Um, everything is being um, checked. You could not, um, I lived in London. Um, uh, I lived in a really nice area called Notting Hill in a small apartment, a house, um, large house, um, beautiful, beautiful house sold for 20 million pounds, 12 million pounds. Um, that was paid in cash by a Russian oligarch. That could rarely happen in the United States. There would have to be checks that there would be, the challenge would be getting that money into the US um, and how, he, how an individual would pay that. Um, as you see here, all of this would um, be blocking a large $12 million, no, that would be $15 million uh, bank transfer from Russia. Okay, who's subject to the screening? The bank account owner, the beneficiary, the person who's receiving the money, um, the collateral owners, uh, co-signers, receiving and sending parties on transfer request. So everybody from every side who's involved in a bank transfer or wire transfer or in a charge can be frozen 
um, their bank account will be completely frozen and there can be no um, movement. Um, that asset um, will be held and there will be an investigation. If the bank finds that this is a mistake, like in my instance, then it's removed and it's all fine. But if the bank account finds that it's something larger, the bank, the bank finds that it's something larger and that there is some connection or something to be concerned about, what happens is that OFAC is immediately alerted, Department of Treasury opens an investigation and they, these individuals will go on this SDN um, list and they will not be allowed in the US. And I mean, they will go further and putting uh, a US citizen also on the list. So the immediate penalties uh, are block and freeze the accounts, uh, corporate and personal fines of up to a million dollars and 12 million in 12, 12 years in jail. And again, this is for both sides. This is for the US individual who's doing the business with the person um, who has raised uh, OFAC issues. Um, civil penalties of up to two, 250. So for a private individual, not a company, and then forfeiture of funds or other property involved in the violation. So if somebody has put up their home as part of a deal, that home will also be seized. Um, it's not a joke. It's uh, I've seen it happen in, uh, with numerous African leaders who came, especially to in the area of Virginia in the US, um, the seizing of their properties once it was um, made public what they were involved in, what crimes, what um, smuggling, whatever they were, they were doing, um, everything will be frozen and they'll go on the SDN list. So as I mentioned, uh, OFAC also covers evasion, avoidance, facilitation, providing material support. So you don't have to just be the direct individual um, who's maybe uh, identified as being part of the sanction list. If you are in any way assisting the movement of that money or property or, or whatever, or arms, um, the sanctions will apply to you as well. You could be a third party um, uh, in any way um, involved in engaging in acts that evade or avoid. Um, OFAC restrictions. Of particular note, assisting or providing material support to foreign parties in engaging in sanction violations or eva evading san uh, sanctions is a, a federal violation. So facilitation in this context is defined as assisting a foreign person in engaging in activities that would violate um, sanctions law if performed by US person. So uh, this can be accounting firms, uh, banks that don't notify OFAC. There's all sorts of people that can be held liable. And these individuals, uh, the bank accountant, um, whoever will also be put on the SDN list. So when the sanctions are imposed um, by the US government, um, there can be a range. It can be a range from a simple designation of an individual for asset blocking, um, all the way to a comprehensive trade investment ban, which is what we saw yesterday that Biden um, put against Russia. Sanctions are often, often uh, imposed on an incremental basis for dealing with foreign affairs problems. So it becomes, you have the Russian encroachment in Ukraine from. 2014, uh, searing use of chemical weapons, different factual political situations that then set up a sanctions scheme. So from, from what's happening this week, there is going to be a whole new, when you go on their website, there will be a whole sanction scheme falling under uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, so it's a very moving current um, establishment of sanctions. Another thing that the department uh, that OFAC can do is they can reach out to other departments within the United States. Um, for example, with the Ukraine, the uh, prior Ukraine uh, Russia sanctions, uh, the Bureau of Industry and Security within the Commerce Department. Um, so these are the ones who are running perhaps purchases of, of you know, parts, parts machinery, this or that, they um, will then maintain a number of sanctions so that they will be there part of the Commerce Department ensuring that no business is carried out. Um, so it goes different levels through the US governments once OFAC, um, once the Department of Treasury um, has formalized and um, put in place uh, sanctions.
So the uh, sanctions that are, have been coming out, the power that is being used from them um, is different than the one that we're gonna talk about now with the Magnitsky Act. Um, the Magnitsky Act, came about separately and, and I'll go through um, how, through, an, um, through a congressional bipartisan decision. All of the sanctions that we're discussing, discussing, discussing against Russia, um, Iran, uh, Venezuela is here. Um, they came under a power of the president called CATSA, C-A-A-T-S-A. -A -A. It's called, um, I'm so sorry, I have congestion. Um, countering America's adversaries through Sanctions Act. So this power, um, the president signed into law um, in 2017. So this is now, uh, expanded the sanctions power of the executive branch. And again, when I say executive branch, this is not Biden or Trump sitting with lists of people and this this is the Department of Treasury. So the Department of Treasury goes directly under the president. Um, so you will see throughout documentation, if you go further in examining this, um, the president has identified the president. That is because the department is, um, an OFAC is directly under the president of the United States under the executive power. So in addition to restricting entrance is the issuance of visas. So when somebody comes to a US embassy anywhere in the world, uh, if they are in some way, uh, when they're examined, their name comes up, they're sent. Um, and if that name appears on an OFAC list, on an SDN list, if their name is connected to somebody on this list, but just you know, professional connection, family connection, they will be denied a, a visa to the United States. There's also a number of lists that are separate um, from what we're talking about, you know, the Ukraine-Russia sanctions, the um, uh, Venezuelan sanctions, the Iran Iranian, uh, there's a whole Western Balkan section of sanctions. Uh, you have the sa sectoral sanctions identification list, you have foreign sanctions evaders list. So the OFAC has an entire list of people who haven't, um, who have uh, evaded sanctions, who have not, who are not, uh, have not been caught, but who are, um, have on numerous occasions um, been implicated in um, evading sanctions. You have non-SDN Palestinian legislative uh, council list, Iranian sanction list, list of foreign uh, financial institutions, list of foreign financial institutions subject to correspondent account payable through act sanctions. Um, so these are banks that are working. Um, I, I think this is probably where they uh, have placed unless they're coming through this Ukraine US, but banks that are working in some way and they can show should be sanctioned themselves. And all of these lists are prepared by OFAC, held by OFAC. They are as public as I've I've seen, you can see the list of the names, you can see the lists of um, the entities. Um, the new ones I don't believe are up yet, the ones that, um, but there is mention of them on, on OFAC's uh, website. There is also a National Emergencies Act, the IEEPA, which allows um, an immediate um, executive order by the president to um, place sanctions. Um, so that in that instance, it becomes, it doesn't have to go under any of um, the groupings that we discussed. Um, so our sanctions program have been mandated by Congress usually to use specific legislation or uh, to in initiate a sanctions program. It is possible under this um, uh, law, the Emergencies Act, for the president to uh, issue sanctions separate from legislation and without having to go all the way through Congress um, and separate from um, sanctions lists, which already are, are, are existing. Okay, so this is um, the full list. Anyway, this is the full list and you can see the type of sa sanction scheme. And then you can see the date, the latest, um, that the latest changes have been made. So Magnitsky sanctions, you can see 12, 10. Uh, so in the US it's opposite of December 10th, uh, 2020. 
um, Russian harmful foreign activity sanctions. This is um, two days ago, yesterday. <laughs> um, you have, let's go to the next page. I can't see what the top one is. Then you have Ukraine, Ukraine, Russia sanctions. And this is, again, this is um, two days old. Um, it's possible that more were put today, different um, to specific case. And this is the human rights sanctions that came out of the death of um, Sergei Magnitsky. Um, he, uh, I think, um, I don't, I don't want to tell you like what you already know, uh, but I'll just very briefly um, say that it was this fund that was started in, um, uh, in uh, Russia by a man named Bill uh, Bowder. Um, uh, and he uh, started a fund called the Hermitage. Um, he was co-founder of a group called Hermitage Capital. Um, he started something called Hermitage Fund. Um, he actually was a big proponent of Vladimir Putin. Um, only um, when he started getting at the different boards and really going after corruption um, and pushing questioning of, of things did this change. And this man, Bill Browder, got um, uh, wasn't allowed to re-enter um, Russia. So he himself had already taken UK citizenship. His wife was from the UK um, in the US. Uh, it's, it's when you read about him, it's listed that he did it because he didn't want to pay US taxes, which are very high. Um, so he's in the UK. Um, he, when he's, he left um, the Hermitage uh, 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 fund was raided, um, all of the stamps and, and uh, official signa were stolen and um, they uh, were given to criminals. And in the end, I think $250 million was stolen uh, from them. Uh, the uh, Browder engaged a man who was um, with a group called Firestone Duncan, a US law firm. Um, who is a tax accountant and tax lawyer, uh, Sergei Magnitsky, to investigate this. He, I think, really believed um, that he could be honest, and he took this to investigators. He testified. He was arrested. He was sick in um, prison. He was not treated. He was beaten in prison, and he died. Um, so this was what um, got, um, and Browder, he was also horribly, um, and we're going to thankfully next week talk about all of this, um, he was tried um, even though he was dead and found guilty um, of tax evasion and um, Browder as well was tried um, in absentia. So Browder was very, um, of course, upset about this. He says that that moment that he got the phone call, everything changed for him. Um, and in 2010, he went to Washington with a list of the Russian officials who he blamed for this. Um, the Obama administration placed, placed sanctions on some of them, uh, which was a routine procedure. Um, but Browder said, this is not enough. He said, you didn't make it public. You didn't seize any assets. So he became, began a campaign to create a law that would go directly after corrupt corruptions. Uh, sorry, corrupt Russians to block their entry into the US and seize their assets. In 2012, Russia was about to become a member of the World Trade Organization and they had to, Congress in order to allow that and to have normal trade relations would have to repeal something called a jackson Vonick Amendment, which aimed to penalize Russia um, with any sort of illegal activities. They didn't want to remove that law without sending in a message to uh, the Kremlin that there was, that the illegal activities couldn't be, um, couldn't, couldn't, couldn't happen and couldn't be carried out. So what they did was they discovered, you know, they, the, the Congress and the president had this proposal by Brower of the Magnitsky proposal. And they realized that this would be a way, this would be a tool to still keep pressure on Russia for human rights violations while allowing them into the World Trade Organization. So on December 14th, 2012, Obama signed the Magnitsky Act into law. Um, and it's called for those that were directly involved in the fraud and in his death 
um, in my deceased death to be denied entry into the United States and their assets in the country seized. Um, in 2016, this law, this um, uh, the Magnitsky Act was um, expanded. And this is a very important um, fact. Um, it was expanded into something called the Magnitsky Global Act, the Global Magnitsky Act. And this is a significant, um, we're gonna do, I hope, yes, we have time, uh, comparison of the, uh, the different um, national uh, ways to deal with corruption. Um, and the Global Magnitsky Act is by far the strongest. Um, it's the most comprehensive um, and really goes after everything. Um, uh, there was a spinoff um, and Canada, Australia, the UK all came up with their version. None of them carries the weight. The European Union also came up and we're gonna look briefly um, at what the European Union has a Manitsi Act, which is, um, uh, this week was the first time I really actually went into it and I am, it's stunning. I mean, for the, the most stunning element is that it doesn't address corruption. It is solely um, dealing with uh, things that you should be keeping people out for anyway, such as genocide, crimes <laughs> against humanity. Um, so I, I will, um, talk about that, but the Global Magnitsky Act um, uh, is, has been very effective and has, um, is of all of the international laws, the strongest. Um, there was a man who was part of an administration um, called Michael McFaul, who's part of Obama's administration. And he, this is a quote from him. He said, the main evidence that the law is having an effect is how obsessed Putin is with it. I don't get why he's obsessed, but the fact remains that he is, and that suggests it's had a tremendous impact. Um, I think some of you might know that there were during the Trump elections, somebody was sent from Russia to really push that if Trump became um, president, that the Magnitsky Act would be thrown out. So it is some sort of an obsession. Um, another quote that I have for you guys is, um, before we move on, I'll do a PowerPoint with um, Magnitsky, the global Magnitsky, is Boris Nemtsov, who was killed, I, I think I pronounced it okay, um, uh, who was murdered uh, on, on a bridge in Moscow. Um, he wrote of the law, it hurts Putin's thieves, murderers, and scoundrels, and benefits this country. So, it has had effects on Russia and, and one of the best things about it is that it has spread a global um, movement um, uh, internationally. Okay, let me pull up. Oh, one thing to remember also is that the Magnitsky Asset was a bipartisan bill. So when it went before Congress um, and for Obama signed it into law, you had equally Republicans and Democrats um, signing it. It was not pushed by either side. I don't know if it would be the same thing right now. So the Global Magnitsky Act is an expansion, as I said, of the Magnitsky Act. The Magnitsky Act was really directed just towards that crime um, and the people who were accountable and involved in that crime. This, um, the global one has taken what was in that and expanded it much further. Um, it's international. It's expanded towards any individual anywhere in the world um, who commits um, not just corruption, um, which is what the Magnitsky Act um, and, and, and murder was focused on, but all um, uh, international crimes. So to impose sanctions with respect to persons responsible for gross violations of internationally recognized human rights, and for other purposes. So this is the reason that this, this law was um, created. So a foreign person in the law is somebody who's not a permanent resident of the U U United States. Person isn't an individual or entity. So this law applies not just to individuals. It also applies to entities that are not organized under US law. This law does not apply to US companies. It does not apply to US citizens. It applies specifically to foreigners um, and to um, foreign, foreign owned or organized um, companies. Sanctions can be imposed with respect to any foreign person that is responsible for extrajudicial killings, torture, gross violations of internationally recognized human rights. 
committed against any individual in any foreign country who seeks to uh, expose illegal activity carried out by a government official to pay, obtain, exercise, defend, or promote internationally recognized human rights and freedoms, such as the freedom of religion, freedom of expression, association and assembly, and the rights to a fair trial and democratic process. So any individual who's involved in extrajudicial killings, torture, any violations of human rights, doing this because he's exposing um, and, and, and has been subjected to the, and has done this to an individual who was a whistleblower, who was exposing illegal activity, or who was trying to protest, to do freedom of expression, to write articles, to expose things. All of these individuals are now protected um, under this Global Magnitsky Act. Sanctions can be exposed with any, to any person that acts as an agent of a foreign official for extrajudicial um, killings, torture, gross violations. So it's not just that individual. It's not just the um, police officer. It's, you know, it, it goes, the, the purpose of this is to encompass and put under a joint criminal um, theory that it is the person who is ordering this behavior all the way down to the person who's carrying it out. Sanctions can be imposed with respect to any foreign person that's a government official or a senior associate of such an official that is responsible for complicit in ordering, controlling, or otherwise directing acts of significant corruption, including the expropriation or private and public assets for personal gain. So any government official who's involved in this um, corruption can be um, uh, brought under the uh, uh, sanction under the Magnitsky, Global Magnitsky Act. Corruption related to government contracts or the extraction of natural resources, bribery, facilitation of transfer of the proceeds of corruption to foreign jurisdictions. Sanctions can be imposed against any foreign person that is materially assisted, sponsored, or provided financial, material, or technological support for or goods or services in the support of an activity described above. So if you have, um, for example, somebody running illegal diamond mines where people are being abused and this is public and then he punishes everybody, it's not just the owner of that mine. It's going to be the person in Holland who is transporting the diamonds. It's going to be the person who is in the U, uh, you know, in Israel who is running this or that. Every person involved in the corruption is covered by this. It's not just directed towards um, the, the perpetrator or the most senior official. What are the sanctions? Inability, inability, ineligibility to receive a visa to the United States. If they have a visa, it will be revoked. Their property will be blocked. All their trans transactions and property and interests in property in a foreign person, if that property is in the US or comes within the possession or control of a US person will be blocked. So if you have a big apartment building that you own and you have a property owner, a property manager and um, uh, some, some company running it, all of that will fall back under, um, be seized and fall back to the um, US government. Information to be considered in, in imposing sanctions. Uh, it's all to be provided to Congress. Uh, it's by appropriate congressional committee. So you have congressional committees such as the Foreign Affairs Committee, the Human Rights Committee. There's numerous committees that are gathering this information. But um, uh, this information is also being held uh, in OFAC. OFAC is the main place, the department within the treasury that is gathering this. When they're going to be issuing the sanctions, then it will go um, to the president and to congressional committees. Equally, equally the material that is gathered um, by the US government is given equal weight as that that is brought by NGOs that monitor human rights violations. So that's something really important to keep in mind that this, this act is geared towards giving NGOs internationally in the US 
um, a voice and a place to bring um, a complaint. Timeline. <clears throat> so 120 days after a report um, is received, it must be determined if that person has engaged in such an activity. So you will have to present a full file, usually a bank statements, um, transaction statements, um, uh, criminal, uh, you know, if it's a, a, it results in the murder of somebody, the, the death certificate, all of this will have to be presented. Um, and then there'll be a determination if it's correct, if, if that person has actually engaged in that. Um, and then it will go forward to uh, the head of a congressional committee, whether to impose sanctions or not. And the description of that sanctions that are requested. A person that violates or attempts to violate or conspires to violate or causes a violation of the imposition of sanctions shall be subject to penalties under section 206 of the International Emergencies Economic Powers Act. So this is what I discussed um, earlier, which gives the executive authority an immediate ability. That act gives them the power um, Again, we'll say everything you read says the president, but it's actually the Department of Treasury acting on behalf of the president, um, <clears throat> immediate um, action to sanction um, that person without having to go through um, Congress. So the civil penalty, civil pen penalty meaning um, if it was, you know, illegal trade, it's not to exceed 250000 or uh, an amount that's twice the amount of the transaction. So if it was a $2 billion um, <laughs> illegal transfer, the maximum you could do is um, close to $4 billion. It couldn't be over $4 billion. Criminal penalty, um, fine not more than a million dollars or maybe imprisoned for more than 20 years or both. <clears throat> so it is possible that sanctions are incorrectly imposed um, and they can be removed 15 days after notification if there is credible information that a person did not engage in that activity that sanctions were imposed for the person has been prosecuted for the activity that sanctions were imposed for, and the person has credibly demonstrated a change in behavior, paid appropriate consequences for how, perhaps they've been arrested and prosecuted in their own country, um, and credibly committed to not engage in the activity in the future. And there has to be uh, the last, uh, uh, this is directly from uh, the, the act, the um, termination of sanctions is in a vital national security of the United States. So it's essential to show not that the US is willing to just punish these um, people who perpetrate um, corruption, violations, um, stop free association, protests, um, uh, articles being written. It's not just important to show that they prosecute, but it's essential to show that if there is a change, that there is a, going to also be a reward. If a country is able to show, if an individual is able to show um, that they have gotten rid of whatever was causing this corruption um, and have made a positive change. The US wants to make it clear that there's going to be a reward for that and that the sanctions will be lifted. So every year, so if you have a standing sanction against, um, there's one I saw recently when I was reviewing new ones um, uh, against a Serbian arms dealer, um, that sanction against him will be reviewed every year. Um, the date for review of sanctions is December 10th, which is International Human Rights Day. And in the report, uh, so the Department of Treasury will file a report stating this person has not stopped, this is actually increasing, there's more problems, we have evidence that he's moving arms to Russia, he's moving, the, you, so they will add in all the new evidence, and that report is public, it is filed in the Federal Register. Sanctions that we were, um, that I was talking about with, um, that came out yesterday were all under um, the Emergency Act. So they were not, they did not have to go through any specific, they were separate from the other Ukraine, Russia um, sanctions. It's called again, the International Emergency Economic Powers Act. And one other interesting thing is that, um, as I was mentioning how the Department of Treasury can then go to the Department of Commerce to kind of accentuate the effect um, they um, they did just that. 
uh, yesterday. They took um, the uh, they took to the commerce um, uh, uh, the proposal to block all technological um, shipping to Russia, and this is means um, it's, the the goal is to hobble uh, defense, aerospace, shipping industries, um, but it goes further than any other U.S. commerce sanction ever. Um, uh, so this is the biggest, yesterday was sort of the biggest sanctions, um, the bank uh, PVB, I think, that it went, was the largest bank that has ever been um, sanctioned by um, the U.S. So this is, we're like talking about it, <laughs> but we're actually all um, now um, part of, of, of what we're what we're talking about. Um, so let me go just quickly back uh, and finish with the global uh, magnesia. One very interesting thing under Donald Trump, in fact, uh, there was um, executive order um, 13818, which broadens the scope even further of the Magnitsky Act. The executive order changes the requirement of gross violations of internationally recognized human rights, which is really you know, the worst, uh, which would trigger um, universal jurisdiction to serious human rights abuses. A serious human rights abuse is being beaten in jail, uh, being detained for no reason, not given trial. So there is, um, I do know that there's a part, um, it's called the Navalny, uh, there's, there is a, a sanction being built on that from this executive order. Um, it changes significant acts of corruption that's in the Global Magnitsky Act to just corruption. Um, it eliminates the requirement that the facilitation or transfer of the proceeds of corruption only applies to transfer from uh, to foreign jurisdictions. So that means that it allows the US government greater latitude in making designations. The serious human rights abuse standard um, included includes now, it can be governmental, non-governmental actors, um, and it's, it's lowered that standard. So it's made it um, uh, much broader and much easier to apply. And it falls, many, many more people will now fall under um, the, uh, Global Magnitsky Act, December 7th, 2020. So uh, four years after the Magnitsky Act, um, the EU created one. So the most important thing to know, the most significant difference is that it's law. this law does not apply at all to corruption. It is only uh, concerning human rights violations and it's big time human rights violations, genocide, crimes against humanity, um, serious human rights violations, um, torture, slavery, extrajudicial summary or arbitrary ex executions and killings, enforced disappearance of persons, arbitrary uh, arrests or detentions. So trafficking in human beings, uh, sexual gender based violence, uh, violations of abuses of freedom and uh, assembly and association, freedom of opinion and expression, abuses of freedom, religion, and belief. This sounds great, but if you look at the top, it says they have to be widespread and systematic. It has to be a policy, um, a common policy of whoever you're you're looking to sanction. So it can't be just a um, you know stopping one or two protests or abusing um, in detention the way that under, especially the new executive order in the US when they see global when they see really will go after every level. This really is looking for something that is like a pattern over, uh, over a number of years. So much, much higher um, requirement. And it's looking for violations under international law, which to me, I mean, this is now personal. This is insane. This is literally there's there there are sanctions for this already. There are also penalties for this um, uh, under under European law, under the laws of different European nations. So this is just bringing it together under a new name, um, but it's not really adding very much um, to to prosecuting um, violators. So what can they do if it is systematic, if it is the systematic, you know, not allowing people to associate or is it um, uh, war crimes? You can hold funds and economic resources. Uh, you can 
that they, that means that they have you have to show that they've provided financial, technical, or um, material support in planning, directing, ordering, assisting, preparing with those acts. So there's actually now a burden of proof that is. Uh, you have to directly show that those funds that are being frozen were going towards those actions. Again, shrinking, shrinking from the powers of uh, the U.S. Act. Um, and it allows many derogations. Uh, this is uh, it, uh, to me. <laughs> um, so if this person that you're looking at needs to, uh, if the individual, let's say this Albanian mayor needs, you, you've seized him, you know that he's running, a, stopping all sorts of um, public protests, he's abusing people in prison, you know that there's a pattern and you know he's doing using finances for this. If he needs money for food, <laughs> for his mortgage, to pay his lawyer, um, to see a diplomat to discuss this, there, you're allowed to use your money. Um, there are no exemptions like this in the uh, US one. Um, so member states can release the funds if there is uh, uh, arbitration and it's decided, um, or if there's a court decision, um, as long as it doesn't, isn't contrary to public policy. They put the obligation on, um, on the, the person who's being investigated to provide the information. Um, there is no mention in the EU law of NGOs uh, being involved. Penalties, um, they vary. It's not set out like the US, um, but they are supposed to be proportionate. Um, and having worked in international courts, which the penalties fell under more, much more European law. They are much lower, much, much lower than um, US. So where do they have jurisdiction? They have, it's really um, located, it has to be somehow connected to a member state. So if um, it's an action that's occurring completely in a different place um, in Africa, for example, um, and not touching in any way. There's no member, there's no, the person doesn't have any connection to Europe. The whole thing is happening separately. This law can't apply in the US changing and the US really taking a strong stand in human rights. It's resulted in a global movement um, where, as I said, you have Canada, you have Australia, you have, um, you have even other countries that are trying to get one. Actually, Kosovo is one country that's trying to get one. Small countries are now trying to push this, which is wonderful and it's great, but they're not all equal. Um, so I did a comparison. <clears throat> so in terms of human rights, first of all, the US Global Magnitsky um, Act's um, violations of internationally recognized human rights. And uh, as you saw with the executive order, it lowered the standard to serious human rights abuses. Canada specifically states, um, which is closer to the original Magnitsky Act, extrajudicial killings, torture, gross violations of internationally recognized human rights. The UK, violations of the right to life. Um, it's, the UK law is called Global Human Rights Sanctions Regulations. Um, right to life, torture or cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment, slavery, forced or compulsory labor. The EU is um, really going for the hardcore violations of genocide, torture, slavery, and it has to be, if, if you're looking at something lower, such as human trafficking, freedom of association, religion and uh, restrictions on religion and belief, uh, restrictions on opinion and expression, it has to be widespread and systematic. The US specifically bans corruption. Canada, significant corruption. The UK, serious corruption. The EU, corruption is completely not covered or mentioned in their uh, Magnitsky Act. The victims. Um, so in under the US, um, it's protecting whistleblowers, human rights defenders. The executive order doesn't specify it. And if anything, it, it has expanded it. Perpetrators government officials, associate, a person acting on their behalf, anybody connected, any third party knowing or involved in um, the corruption or human rights violation can be prosecuted. Uh, Canada, 
whistleblowers, human rights defenders, and the perpetrators, it's focused on government officials or associates of the government. The UK, it's not specified about the victim, um, which I actually think is not bad because it broadens, it allows a broader interpretation, allows many more levels of um, victims to be protected. Um, and however, the perpetrators are public officials or people involved in corrupting public officials. And again, in the EU, EU there's no specification about um, the victim or the perpetrator, any roles that they have to um, have. <clears throat> the criteria. So for the Global Magnitsky Act, uh, the US one, it's responsible for or complicit in human rights violations or corruption. Uh, the US, ex as I mentioned, the executive order, complicit in abuses or leader, official organization involved in abuses, facilitating corruption of human rights abuses. It broadens it. It really takes it down through to many, many groups. You can have in terms of one crime, one corruption, one human rights violation, an examination of as many people as are involved, be it 30 people or 20. Um, Canada, responsible or complicit in human rights violations, facilitating corruption, responsible. So it's a much, it's more direct. You have to be more directly connected to the actual crime. Um, responsible for involved in facilitating abuses. Uh, associated with or belonging to an involved organization. And then in the EU, um, responsible for or facilitating associated with responsible or facilitating persons. So um, it becomes uh, uh, a bit more restricted uh, by the time you get to the EU. And here are the numbers. Um, and this is since um, I put August, the last date I could get was August 31st, 2021. Um, the since <laughs> after this week, it's probably gonna be 10 times more. Um, but the US has designated 320 individuals and entities. Um, Canada has um, a designated 70. The UK 80 for human rights and 27 for corruption. So remember that the U UK sanctions rule is divided. It has a um, uh, different uh, scheme and two different documents, one for human rights and one for corruption, but they're con connected under their um, global sanctions program. Um, the EU 19. Uh, the United States um, prosecuted people from 40 different countries, Canada five, the UK 18 and uh, European Union six. But remember those six had to have had some link um, to a member state of the European Union. UK measures come from four different texts. The first of them were called the Criminal Finances Act of 2017, which provides a definition of human rights abuses and the people that commit them. And um, it's used again by the Sanctions and Anti-Money Laundering Act of 2018. Um, again, the UK this week has just shaken off all of their laws. So I, I would have to, um, you know, pull that together because there's now all new um, legislation concerning sanctions and they've also um, uh, stopped all visa waivers for people coming in with large sums of money. So this was the Sanctions and Anti-Money Laundering Act of 2018 was designed as a general framework for all kinds of sanctions. And that's um, had to be done um, and created under UK law because it was coming after um, Brexit. Um, so based on the principles set out in the act, the government adopted global human rights sanction regulations again in 2020 and global anti-corruption sanctions in April 2021. So put together, they cover similar areas as the EU and the US. Um, they are more specific, but there's two separate um, uh, documents, two separate sets of regulations. In Canada, it is um, in 2017, they established the Victims of Corrupt Foreign Officials Act, which they call the Sergei Magnitsky Law. And it was closely uh, modeled on US legislation. Uh, the EU's restrictive measures against human rights violations and abuses were not adopted until December 2020, uh, following the usual EU practice of established um, by uh, the Treaty of Functioning European Union. The legal framework comprised two simultaneously adopted but separate pieces of legislation. So to help member states and EU companies implement the, regula the regulation, the European um, Commission detailed um, guidelines. They 
uh, have um, a group called the Directorate General for Financial Stability. It's called DGFISMA is the acronym. That is the equivalent, I would say, um, tasked with the equivalent of the US Department of Treasury. That is if you were going to, um, as an NGO contact, um, uh, the European Union for imposing sanctions. This is who is gathering the information. It's not the committee of the EU or human rights committee. It's the Director General for Financial Stability, Financial Sa Services and Capital Markets Union. They prepare the sanction list, they gather the information and the evidence, and uh, then they work with um, the Council of Foreign Relations. Uh, uh, but it's also responsible for um, putting into EU law um, any UN sanctions that may be coming. So they are um, very similar uh, role to the US Department of Treasury. DG FISMA, I'll use the acronym, is also in charge of monitoring on behalf of the European Commission, the implementation and enforcement of EU sanctions across member states. They're increasingly supporting member states in their efforts to apply sanctions. So they work um, as the centralized office, not just to get the information on who should be sanctioned, on gathering evidence, on developing this, the, the specific and appropriate sanction, but they'll monitor after the sanction is imposed what is happening there. Um, and they support whatever man, uh, member state might have had the issue coming into them. So for example, if Germany was, um, or yeah, yeah, Germany's bank was dealing in some way, that this is where they would report. They would go to DG FISMA, and then DG FISMA would continue to monitor them and to monitor how um, the sanction that they have created is um, affecting, uh, is, is whether it's changing anything and whether it's being imposed. So another one, how recently must a crime have been committed for the US government to consider designating? Um, so they won't usually go beyond five years from the date of when um, the crime occurred. Um, so if uh, the, the alien, uh, the, the person who's not a US citizen um, uh, was involved in this or that, uh, corruption or something, from the date that this is pu public, um, the U.S. will not um, usually keep them um, uh, on uh, the, the sanctions list. So under this logic, sanctions need to be administered relatively close in time to the sanctioned activity. So if you find somebody who is doing corruption, don't wait 10 years. Bring them, um, bring, bring the information, the documentation as soon as you have, um, because otherwise it's seen mainly as uh, uh, punishment for a past act. So if somebody, um, if you can show he's continually doing it, if you can say, you know, yesterday he was still, you know, committing these illegal acts and sending money and, and, and continuing corruption, then that's fine, even if it started 10, 20 years ago. But if you're showing that an act happened 10 years ago, it's very unlikely. Um, if you only have proof from 10 years ago, it's very unlikely um, that that the U.S. will um, pursue um, sanctioning him. So what type of information is necessary? What do you need? What is the burden of proof that you need to bring um, to build uh, a case under the Global Magnitsky Act? And I'm sorry, I am focusing on it because in my opinion, really looking at this, um, it's, it's definitely the strongest one, especially with this executive order. Um, so now is definitely um, the time and, and it is the best um, tool. So example, you know, in, if you're presenting something in the court in the United States, you have to show that this document was moved from this, there has to be signatures, there's to be a chain of custody. It's a much lower standard um, because, the US, but because the US government needs to be able to defend potential legal challenges to designating somebody um, for sanctions. And again, I said, oh my God, there's law firms in Washington that just do this, that just try to get sanctions and removed from different companies that just work on getting property and assets back, getting bank accounts unblocked and removing people from the SDN list. 
So you have to be, the US government has to feel confident enough that the material that you've provided would be able to stand up in court. Although at the time that you're submitting it, it doesn't need to be this highest standard um, that would be required. So there has to be, the threshold is a reason to believe and based on credible information. So it doesn't try to exceed this level of proof in most cases. So to establish a reasonable basis of belief that an entity has engaged in behaviors that are described um, by the Magnitsky Act, each piece of evidence must be corroborated by mul multiple, preferably independent sources. So if you have journalists who are monitoring um, you know, people being arrested for, for protesting, and you have actual victims, and perhaps best of all, you have somebody who's doing it and who can, who can testify that these acts were done, um, or you have a person here who received a wire that was strange, and then you can corroborate with, you know, where the money came from, and who sent it, that will be sufficient. Um, so it's not the highest standard of proving that every single piece of evidence where it came from or how it was done, but the best is always um, independent sources. So there's a serious human rights abuse checklist. And now focus on, on human rights part and not the corruption part. Um, was he subjected to serious human rights for abuse? Um, was the perpetrator um, tied directly to it or was he involved um, uh, as an associate or a partner or made aware and he was in a position to punish or stop? Um, when it's based on, can it be shown, when it's based on his status as a leader, can it be shown that the individual was a leader, um, including of a government that was engaged in or whose members were engaged in uh, seri serious human rights abuses? if it was an entity whose property and interests in property are blocked as a result of activities related to the uh, leaders of official, if that has happened already, perhaps through European Union, through you can bring that in um, again as evidence of, of this person's uh, involvement. Did they attempt um, to assist again, like I said, was he party by assisting or helping um, in any of that? You, your, uh, the U.S. Magnitsky Act is always going to look at that. They want to make the circle as broad as possible. Anybody who is involved as an associate, as a partner, um, through knowledge of it, bring evidence of those additional um, individuals. It doesn't have to just be the one who committed the act or was ordered the act. So in terms of a corruption, uh, oh, and also please bring um, everything that you can of personal identifiers, such as if you are able to get a copy of their birth certificate, of their full legal name, um, anything, any documentation where you can show who this individual is. Um, and uh, then we start looking at the level of corruption. Was the perpetrator a member of the government? Um, was he a person acting on behalf of an official? Um, can it be shown that the individual was a leader of that entity? Did they affect to assist? So it continues um, on both levels in terms of corruption and the human rights abuses and looking at the full circle of people involved and at the level of um, people involved. Um, so also if you have something like torture, if you can get independent reports, if you can get hospital, hospital reports, um, medical reports, um, uh, uh, I think when the original Magnitsky um, Act was being drafted. He brought, he, um, Bill Bowder, um, hired private investigators. So he was able to get photographs and details. That's an important um, part of it is showing the actual crime um, and the credibility of the individuals making the claims. So some, you, you know, of course, many of you are lawyers, you would know you wouldn't bring somebody who has a bad record and you would bring people who are victims, who were um, part of the, you know, who, who saw it, who were part of it and, and want to testify um, uh, are, are, are the ideal people to give statements um, for the Global uh, Magnitsky Act. Also, does the individual that you're looking at have a criminal record that if, if it's possible to obtain that, bring that? Um, 
in cases of torture, uh, if you have other activists who've been tortured in the same facility, um, bringing that. Um, and I'm gonna also look up for next week because I know that there's a whole group working on the Navalny um, sanctions. So I'm gonna pull that uh, information up for you. Um, in the US, there's a group working uh, in the Department of Treasury on building sanctions for, I think it's called the Navalny 35, or it's a group um, that they're looking to sanction. Um, so in cases of, um, if you're saying it was the head of this bank or the head of um, a political group, it's good to have um, documentation that references the official job description and shows who this person was in um, the chain of, uh, of command. So how long does it take from the time that you deliver the materials um, as an NGO and they arrive in the treasury department? Um, how long does it take? Uh, the average time is six to nine months, uh, which is quick, in fact. Um, so uh, they, um, the number of, of groups has just been increasing. It was a small group when the first Magnitsky app came out. It was based on that. But as it grew each year, there's more and more um, uh, openings of sanctions uh, under the Global Magnitsky Act. So when the Department of Treasury creates a report based on, um, on this, they're going to be um, describing the crimes, what's happened. But they're also going to be proposing sanctions. So that's also important, if, if possible, to obtain, you know, bank records, um, details about this person. I, I think a few, when we were doing the U European Court of Human Rights, um, there was a mention, I think, of a Russian judge who is coming. I mean, that's something that would be very like amazing to put before the, the commission and, and, and bring that forward uh, because there is a period where you can examine that. And the same thing, you need proof. You'll need um, not just newspaper articles, but some sort of proof, be it maybe a, a statement by somebody or uh, investigation into that person, bank statements. It's the same, um, same here with the US, um, what they're gonna look for um, in, in in determining how they're gonna impose um, sanctions. Ah, it's also possible if there is um, sensitive information, you can put a classified annex. So as I was saying, the names and everything are publicly available on the website. If you have material that you're providing um, and it is witness statements of people whose lives could be at risk, you um, there's never been a time according to this person who I spoke to at Treasury, that there's been a leak. There's never been a time that this has happened. Um, so that individual being a witness, whoever who's not part of the um, charges, um, that person you can put in a request and file it as a classified annex. So let's say you have 10 statements by people who were um, uh, uh, abused by this individual and you don't want their names to be released, you can do this as um, filing as a classified annex so that the details will be there for um, the department to see, but they won't ever be publicly um, put into any sort of federal record. Yeah, so this is the quote that I got. The safety and security of people and groups working to build and submit case files to the US government is a primary concern. The state and treasury departments have been clear that they treat the information shared with them by NGOs as confidential and that to date, there are no known cases of leaks of sensitive information related to the sanctions process. So it's unclear how much of the information sent by NGOs could potentially be exposed um, by a lawsuit or by anything. But if you enter um, as an NGO submitting case files with sensitive material, um, they're counseled to mark the documents as protected from public disclosure under FOIA exemptions four and six. So FOIA exemptions, and I'll, I'll note that because we're gonna be wrapping up, but FOIA exemptions are federal um, uh, laws that allow uh, documents to be made public. So if you're putting in protected people, it's best to put in, um, put that uh, as on, on top of the documentation to ensure that it, it's never going to be released in, in anything because of the protection of um, the security of witnesses or of yourself um, 
uh, in, in the process. So as a general rule, it is better to not put identifying information, but if it's essential for the case and you do um, put that uh, document on top, it's also possible to, when you're negotiating with, uh, speaking with the Department of Treasury to ask if it's maybe preferable to redact the names. So um, that could be left to you or to them um, to sort of black out um, any time a specific um, person who could be endangered by this process um, is listed. They've, they have allowed redaction and they've also allowed the use of pseudonyms um, to protect um, witnesses and people who are um, not perpetrators of any of the um, uh, things that you're looking to uh, use the Magnitsky Act for. Yeah, and this is, uh, for good or bad, as I said, there's law firms that just work on this. So it's actually a very, if you want to appeal to OFAC, uh, if you're on a list and you want to appeal, they really do examine it. Um, it tends to not even go to court, uh, but um, they don't tend to put people on this list unless they've done something. <laughs> so that's, um, to, to date, um, a very, very few people have um, been removed um, from uh, the uh, sanctions list or from the specially designated persons list. 